already, so we start. Our first panel deals with history, with a psychological perspective on historical events and on the role that empathy could play both in understanding and shaping of history. In one of his conversations with his biographer, Charles Tozier, Heinz Kohut emphasized the role of the historian as a self-object for society and culture. He spoke with great and deep warmth about his high school teacher, history teacher, and described the perspective, as he said, he had learned from him, a bored and unified perspective with which one should look at the world, the human phenomena, and its manifestations. So today we will try to follow these footsteps. Both of our speakers are historians. The first lecture deals with historical events that had and still have a profound impact on the life, mind, memory, self-states, feelings, hopes, and horrors of large parts of the world's population and the Israeli society in particular. It examines anti-Semitic rhetorics that had developed in Germany during the period of the Third Reich. The second lecture deals with the complexity of the impact and role that empathy can take in understanding, shaping of history, and conflict resolution. And just before we start, I want to mention a text that Gabi has mentioned before, um, where is it? written, a canonic text, written in the summer of 1932, just before the beginning of the Third Reich regime, and published six months later at the spring of 1933. This is a public correspondence between Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein, which dealt with the question of why war. Gabi already mentioned it. It was written at the request of the Committee on Literature and Arts of the League of Nations, established at the end of First World War. The goal of the project was to advance the common interests of the League of Nations. At the end of his letter to Freud, Einstein asked, is there any possibility of directing the development of humans to be more resistant to the psychosis of hatred and destruction? At the beginning of his answer to this question, Freud prepared Einstein for his answer to be not necessarily optimistic, since, as he wrote, he deals with difficult truths to digest. But, and here I add on Gabby's uh, words, reading Freud's ideas, one can find in them quite an interesting, optimistic statements, which abandon the exclusive real reliance on the ideas of the death instinct in the ahistorical human nature. Trying to make a distinction between the phenomena of war and the phenomena of mere regression, Freud presented the idea of a second human nature based on historical human subjectivity that transcends bio biology and a mixture of inborn impulses. In a statement that has been repeatedly quoted, Freud says, everything that promotes the development of culture also works against war. This correspondence published in Paris on March 1933 was forbidden for publication in Germany, which was already under the National Socialist regime. Two years later, on September 1935, the Nuremberg Laws, the racial laws of Nazi regime, were formulated. Their purpose was to deny civil rights to anyone who does not meet the definition of Aryan race. Four years later, September 1st, 1939, World War II broke out and the Third Reich regime has changed from one extreme to the other our observation of the human phenomena, manifestation, values, and ideals. 
if Freud and Einstein had known about the future of the coming decade and the deep and difficult fingerprints that it had left on our minds ever since, would they have written differently? Is there any understanding missing in this writing of the two 20th century giants? The question remains open, and with this open question, we will turn to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Thomas Kohot. Professor Kohot is a professor of history at Williams College, Massachusetts. He is also a psychotherapist and graduate of the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute and a faculty member of the Cincinnati Center for Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis. In the last years, he had been also director of William Exeter program at Oxford University, visiting fellow and tutor for visiting students at Exeter College, World Fellowship from Williams College for Research in Vienna, and a Fulbright Freud visiting scholar of psychoanalysis at the Freud Museum in Vienna. In his academic writing, Professor Coho deals with the contribution of psychological understanding to the historical research and to understanding historical processes. In particular, his richer deals with the sociocultural process that took, in German, took place in Germany during the Third Reich period. The paper you have received this morning is not the text of the lecture that Professor Court will now give, but it reflects the spirit of his ideas. The title of the lecture is Popular Antisemitism During the Third Reich, a Self-Psychological Perspective. Okay, can you hear me? Is this the Oved? How's that? Is that okay? Okay, because I, I, yeah. So thank you all um, for, for coming. I really, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'd just like to begin by uh, apologizing uh, because I, I can't speak Hebrew. And uh, no, and it's, you know, as an American, I'm very sensitive to the fact that so many American academics and politicians and everything assumes that everyone can speak our language. And there's something that's not so great about that, I think. I think it's, it's you know, I can speak German, so if this were in Germany, I could do it in German, but I'm afraid Hebrew is out uh, because I, I don't, I can't speak or understand Hebrew. Um, but I, I just want you to know that I appreciate that it's hard enough to listen to people talk at you for a long period of time even when it is your native language, but when it's not your native language, it can be really exhausting. So I, I, I'm fully aware of that, and uh, I don't know what I can do about it, but I will try to read slowly and clearly uh, so that you, 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 you are less tired than you're going to be anyway. Um, so uh, basically, you're going to be getting a lot of me today, it sounds like, and uh, you'll get to know me intellectually and even, I think, personally. Uh, so the, 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 the talk today that you're going to hear now, this morning, uh, is based on a book that I worked on for 15 years. So that's what historians do. They spend an enormous amount of time studying a small thing uh, in great depth and then hope that it has broader implications beyond the small thing that they've studied. In my case, this is based uh, on oral histories that were done with 62 Germans who were born shortly before the First World War, 
who were very active, as was my father, interestingly enough, in the youth movement during the 1920s, the so-called youth movement of the Bunds, who then uh, were all pretty much enthusiastic national socialists. And then after the war formed a group called the Free German Circle of former youth movement members as a way of handling the whole defeat in the Second World War and the disruption, the total destruction and massive losses uh, that were engendered by the Second World War. And this paper will focus on these interviews, which I've written this book on called uh, A German Generation. And in its original title, which the press took away from me, uh, the original title was A German Generation and Its Search for the Collective Across the 20th Century. Um, so what I'm going to be talking today, this morning, is about that. This afternoon we'll be discussing empathy as a way of knowing in history, at least that's my interest in it, as a way of knowing in history and in psychoanalysis. In other words, as my father used the, phra the phrase frequently as a mode of observation, what I'm going to be talking about this morning is about empathy not as a mode of observation, but as a historical phenomenon in itself, about the lack of empathy or the empathy that Germans uh, experienced for Jews. Um, and uh, so I, I, will, I will read this. I will try, hopefully, we get time, and I will read this slowly, and I will attempt, I will attempt to read this without my glasses. Um, because this is my narcissism, but uh, it may not prove possible, in which case I'll wear my glasses. So um, anyway, let, let me, I'll just keep doing this to you. Uh, I very, the, I'll be turning pages constantly because I made the print really large. So, I could, <laughs> yeah. so uh, let me begin uh, with a personal anecdote. Many years ago, uh, my family and I visited a friend in Brussels in Belgium. The woman we visited is approximately 10 years older than I am, born around 1940. She comes from a Jewish family and survived the Holocaust uh, in hiding in Brussels. During our visit, on a walking tour of the city, we came upon a small construction site in the sidewalk. There was a hole in the pavement about a yard deep with a wooden walkway and a railing. When our Belgian friend saw this construction site, she cried out in a panicked voice, watch out, it's dangerous, be careful. Uh, in reality, the construction site was not dangerous, not even for our children, but her reaction, her panicked reaction, was so familiar to me. My father could have reacted in the same way. He too survived the Holocaust, fleeing Austria as a young man in 1939, and I must confess that I, too, uh, have this panicky reaction sometimes. The world is bright and colorful, the sun is shining, uh, but then out of the corner of one's eye, one glimpses a spot of gray, and suddenly one is seized with the intense anxiety that this little spot will suddenly cover the whole scene in black. This exaggerated uh, from our contemporary, this, the source of this from our contemporary perspective, so exaggerated reaction is not difficult to identify. It was produced by the historical reality of the Holocaust. It happened once exactly like that for Jews living in Belgium and in Austria. The world was bright and colorful, the sun was shining, but suddenly one found oneself in a lethal situation. What today seems an unrealistic and inappropriate panic uh, was then a realistic and appropriate response to extreme danger. The relatives of my father, his aunts, uncles, and cousins who did not have his panicked reaction and remained in Austria were all killed in the genocide. I have related this anecdote at the beginning of today's talk as a dramatic example of the powerful influence of history on the psyche, an influence that exerts itself across the generations. In the late 1970s, when I began my education at the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute and my investigation of the psychological dimension of the past, I studied the life of a historical, historically significant figure Kaiser Wilhelm II. 
in order to explain how his political actions could be understood as an attempt to, sur to solve personal psychological problems. That is to say, I, like other psychohistorians of that time, investigated the influence of individual psychology on history. But as this anecdote illustrates, I have come to appreciate the influence of history on the psyche. Psychologically, we are constituted through our experience of the environment. That environment is constituted by history. Therefore, history constitutes the psyche. Now I investigate how the experience of a historically determined environment shapes the self. Nevertheless, I remain committed to studying people, less great men or great women like the Kaiser, and more ordinary human beings like the 62 Germans I will introduce to you today uh, as makers of history. For as the historian and journalist Sebastian Hafner noted in his memoirs, history is ultimately played out in, quotes, the heart of every individual, every accidental and private person and made in response to uh, the apparently private experiences of thousands and millions of individuals who remain un unaware that their personal decisions have shaped history's course, end quote. I see it as my task, then, to study how the self and history mutually shape one another, or put differently, how history flows through human beings. At its most basic level, my book, A German Generation, is about how history flowed through 62 people. All were Germans born before the First World War. All, as adolescents, were profoundly influenced by their experience in the youth movement of the Bunds during the Weimar Republic. Largely as a result of those ad adolescent experiences, all after World War II joined the Free German Circle, an organization of former youth movement members. The interviewees were approximately the same age and came from the educated Protestant urban middle classes. As a result, they had similar historically determined experiences. Because those experiences were psychologically const constituted constituent, I don't know how you say this word in English, <laughs> let alone Hebrew, Consti constitutive, because those experiences were psychologically constitutive, they were also psychologically similar. In interviews conducted in the mid-1990s, when the interviewees were approximately 80 years old, they told similar life stories and told those stories in similar ways. The book presents their life stories and analyzes how history shaped the psyches of these 62 people as historical forces produced a series of losses for them beginning in the 1920s when they were adolescents. Although the interviewees did not experience their early lives during World War I as traumatic or unhappy, they did experience traumatic hardship and suffering after the war with Germany's defeat and revolution. The interviewees experienced these events largely through their parents and other adults who appear to have reacted to the German defeat with discouragement and depression and to the subsequent political violence and social unrest with fear and a sense of helplessness. The hyperinflation of 1923, which seriously damaged family prosperity and social standing, only increased the parents' sense of failure. As a result of these historically engendered law experiences, the interviewees, along with other Germans belonging to their generation, lost the family as a site of security and stability, and their parents, in particularly their fathers, as admirable, idealizable figures. Rather than mourning and coming to terms with these losses, the interviewees suppressed disappointment, anger, and sadness, and turned to the generational collective of the youth movement, finding the emotional support in the group that had been lost in the family. Thus, these 62 Germans were shaped psychologically by history through the historically engendered losses they had experienced as adolescents during the Weimar Republic. But in responding to those losses, 
These 62 Germans also helped to shape history as they turned from the youth movement to the Nazi community of the people as young adults with the advent of the Third Reich. Indeed, the Volksgemeinschaft became the youth movement's age-appropriate extension. The youth movement group had simply been vastly enlarged and become more socially inclusive, its elitism given a racial caste. Throughout the Third Reich, the interviewees were psychologically sustained and supported through merger with the Volk, a racial collective to which the interviewees and other members of their generation were passionately committed and which, in my view, was at the heart of National Socialism and its popular appeal. Indeed, after 1945, the interviewees again turned to the group, attempting now to overcome the devastating losses of World War II by joining the Free German Circle, the organization of former youth movement members to which all of the interviewees belonged. Thus, throughout their lives, the interviewees responded to historically engendered loss through merger with the collective. The group provided a sense of security and stability, of belonging that one was supported by others like the self. The group provided a sense of agency, authority, and purpose. The group provided a sense of self-esteem and self-confidence. In the group, the individual did not have to achieve greatness on his or her own, but with and through others. The group was there to mirror the greatness of the individual member, and the group was there to amplify the individual, to en enhance his or her power through the power of the collective. Thus, the interviewees found in the group what had been lost to the self, and the group protected them against further loss, for they were dependent not on any single individual who might disappoint, leave, or die, but on the group as a whole. As one interviewee put it, she was sustained over the course of her long life, quote, quotes, through the Gemeinschaft that holds and that endures, end quote. In large measure, because of the central importance of the collective in National Socialist ideology and practice, all of the interviewees were enthusiastic Nazis. Nevertheless, four events are described in the interviews that although not turning those interviewed into opponents of the regime, caused them at least to question National Socialism. The first came in May 1933, four months after the Nazi accession to power, with the ban on the, in on the independent youth movement of the Bunds. The second event was the so-called Röhm Putsch of 30 June 1934. A number of male interviewees found the Nazi purge of top SA and national conservative leaders to be an act of arbitrary violence. Two women reported being deeply distressed by Kristallnacht, the pogrom of 9 November 1938. And finally, one woman recalled her dismay at hearing the rumor during the war that women were being sent to breed with SS men in the Lebensborn homes that had been established for expectant and nursing Aryan mothers and for illegitimate children and orphans who met Nazi racial criteria. What connects these moments of opposition to National Socialism on the part of the interviewees was that they were able to imagine themselves in the place of Nazism's victims. Most of those interviewed were directly and personally affected by the ban on the independent youth movement. Many knew or could identify with the executed SA men, a significant number of whom had been members of the youth movement. The woman's outrage at the Lebensborn project clearly derived from her ability to imagine herself demeaned as one of the women there. And a close reading of the two interviews in which distress over Kristallnacht is, is, is expressed reveals that the ultimate victims of the violence were not, in fact, Jews. Using virtually identical language and unwittingly testifying to the enduring belief in the power of international Jewry, 
both women saw the ultimate victims of the pogrom to be non-Jewish Germans, in fact, their own children, upon whom this act would be avenged. Quote, this is the first. Then I experienced Kristallnacht. My second child, her name I won't say, had just been born. I became extremely depressed. Tears streamed down my face as I nursed her and I said, the poor child will be made to suffer for this. It's a cultural disgrace that the Germans have been the ones to do this. I always said the poor child will have to pay for this crime. Second quote, second woman. It was shortly before the birth of my third child in November 1938. He was born on the 15th. And at some point on the 9th, this so-called Kristallnacht occurred. I was very much alarmed and told my husband already back then, I can remember it today. This will be avenged on us and on our children. Jewish people were the one group of Nazism's victims with whom almost none of those interviewed could empathize. Despite centuries of assimilation, despite the fact that the Jews of Germany looked, talked, and acted like the rest of the population, those interviewed could not imagine themselves in their place, either on Kristallnacht or when watching or when they watched them being deported during the war, or even when they spoke about them in their interviews. The Jews of Germany were simply other, not Germans, not like us, not people in whose place one could ever imagine being. Empathy with Jews was not possible. And so, when confronted with their mistreatment, one simply looked away. The basis of popular anti-Semitism during the Third Reich then was the inability or unwillingness of non-Jewish Germans to imagine themselves in the place of their Jewish fellow citizens. That is the take home message of today's presentation. Now I expect that you will not find it difficult to accept the claim that the absence of empathy played an essential role in anti-Semitism during the Third Reich and in carrying out the final solution. In quotes. Nonetheless, I think we need to take the concept of empathy more seriously and apply it to the people of the past more rigorously uh, than has been the case heretofore. Indeed, historians have generally not characterized anti-Semitism during the Third Reich as a lack of empathy for Jews, but have employed other terms to describe non-Jewish German attitudes toward their Jewish fellow citizens. To cite one prime example, let me turn to Ian Kershaw's famous statement that quotes, the road to Auschwitz was built by hate but paved with indifference. In Kershaw's view, the Germans were latently or passively anti-Semitic, but did not share what he calls the active dynamic hatred of the Nazis, and did not want to see the Jews brutalized, let alone killed. Instead, ordinary Germans, according to Kershaw and many other historians, were fundamentally indifferent to the persecution deportation, and to the extent that they knew about it, the extermination of the Jews. Although most Germans did not wish the Jews to be exterminated, their indifference was nonetheless lethal, according to Kershaw. By passively observing the persecution and deportation of their fellow citizens, by looking away from the evidence of mass killing in the East, and by failing to protest along the way to the final solution, the, Germ the Germans enabled the Nazis to carry out genocide. There is a fundamental problem with using indifference to characterize the attitude of ordinary non-Jewish Germans to the persecution, deportation, and extermination of their Jewish fellow citizens. For anti-Semitism, hostility to Jews, not to speak of the wish to have them killed, means having a strong emotional response to Jews, whereas indifference means having little or no effective response to Jews at all. In order to use indifference in this context, one must posit a categorical difference between the perpetrators, who hated Jews, and the bystanders, who were indifferent to them. That is to say, one must follow historians who make a sharp distinction between the Nazis 
a category that generally goes undefined, and the Germans. On the basis of this distinction, the Nazis were the passionate, hate-filled killers, and the Germans were the unemotional, indifferent onlookers. But of course, most Nazis were Germans, and many Germans were Nazis, or at least sympathetic to National Socialism. And in any event, it is difficult to see how a clear boundary can be drawn between the two. The use of indifference to characterize the attitude of ordinary German, Germans toward Jews is not only psychologically implausible, it, is, it also presumes too sharp a distinction between leaders and led, and fails to take account of the part played by German society in the persecution of the Jews, which was only possible because it resonated with popular anti-Jewish sentiment in Germany. However, if instead of indifference, which creates too wide a gulf between state and society, and a false categorical distinction between Nazi perpetrators and German bystanders, one speaks of a lack of empathy for Jews on the part of Germans, then perpetrators and bystanders do not become qualitatively, qualitatively different human beings, but can be seen as connected to one another, standing at different points on a continuum. Whereas indifferent human beings do not carry out genocide, people lacking in empathy can persecute, deport, and exterminate, or stand by wordlessly, silently, passively, watching the persecution, deportation, and extermination. Neither perpetrators nor bystanders could imagine themselves in the place of the Jews. Jews were for both, to quote an anti-Nazi socialist schoolteacher in 1937, another world. The insight that non-Jewish Germans lack empathy for their Jewish fellow citizens and fellow human beings should not be the conclusion, but the starting point of an investigation of the relationship of Germans to the Holocaust. How, we need to ask ourselves, was empathy closed off by the German people from Jewish people, and why was it closed off? By returning to the interview material, I will attempt in the remainder of my presentation to provide partial answers to these questions. The interviewees experienced the Third Reich in an intensely visual way. What was seen, and crucially what was not seen in Nazi Germany, take on particular significance. As in other oral histories, forced laborers brought to the Reich during the war were a visible presence to the interviewees. By contrast, they generally did not perceive the persecution of Jewish people and the entire extermination project, although they speak at length about this absence in their interviews. Examples of not seeing or looking away from the persecution, deportation, and extermination of Jewish people abound in the interviews, such as a woman who looked away from the deportation of the Jews of Hamburg, Altona. But then I saw, I came, I can still remember exactly, I came from the side and saw that Jews were literally being herded together. I saw it and I looked away and I thought about something else. I continued on my way and didn't get upset about it. I can still see it exactly before my eyes. They wore the star and were literally being herded together on the street. And in retrospect, I consider that to be our guilt, that we didn't concern ourselves about it. I thought about prettier things than, the, about, than about that. Already after taking three steps, I was thinking about something else. I basically didn't acknowledge it to myself, although I still know it and can still see the picture exactly before me. Back then, I, I won't say I repressed it, I simply didn't consciously acknowledge it, not consciously. The act of looking away goes to the heart of the interviewee's anti-Semitism. It was an act that eliminated the possibility of empathy, severing the bond of humanity connecting non-Jewish Germans to the persecuted Jews. It was an eradication of Jewish people from consciousness that mirrored and facilitated their physical annihilation. It is difficult to overemphasize the degree to which those interviewed had developed the capacity for denial, for looking away, from potentially upsetting or conflict-producing situations beginning already in adolescence. They had found the disorder and the strife inside and outside of the family during the Weimar Republic profoundly distressing. 
In the youth movement, they had therefore avoided anything that might provoke tension and discord in the group. After World War II, tolerance was the highest ideal in the free German circle because it enabled them to avoid conflict. On a basic emotional level, the violence done to Jewish people was incompatible with the interviewee's need to experience good feelings, and therefore, in the words of one man, one simply looked away. Of course, one didn't want to see it, you know. As in this statement, interviewees continued to distance themselves from the persecution they had observed and closed their eyes to during the Third Reich by using the third person impersonal pronoun in speaking in the 1990s about the mistreatment of Jews. I didn't witness the mistreatment. One didn't, mistreat, didn't witness the mistreatment. Another woman uses not only the third person impersonal pronoun, but also the passive voice in describing the deportation of Jewish people to extermination camps. Quotes. In reference to the Jews, one saw, one saw in Frankfurt that people were being transported away. They had to collect at the East Railway Station and then were transported away. And one thought, one thought, that they were being taken to the East. One didn't think any more closely about it. They were supposedly being resettled there. Indeed, interviewees in this study and in other oral histories frequently use the passive voice in recalling the persecution and deportation of Jewish people. It is, it is as if the mistreatment of Jews occurred of its own accord, without human agency, will, or coercion. The Jewish acquaintances of interviewees suddenly vanished from their world. Jewish classmates suddenly disappeared from interviewees' schools. Jewish neighbors were gone all of a sudden, and no one knew where they went. In order to maintain good feelings, the physical violent mistreatment of human beings by human beings had to be denied. In the same way that those interviewed looked away from vanishing Jews, that's the quote, uh, so too most looked away from the Holocaust by denying that they knew about it until after 1945. Despite their denials, a significant number also reveal in their interviews that they did, in fact, have knowledge of the genocide before that date. Thus, one woman denied knowledge of the final solution, asserting that only the higher-ups were in the know, and then in the same breath conceded that she saw the concentration camp at Bergen-Belsen on a Wehrmacht tour, as well as Jews in cattle cars outside of Hamburg. A woman Hitler youth leader was kept in the dark and informed exactly. Quote, as leaders, we were separated from the rest of the population. No one told us anything or brought, us, brought anything to us. As crazy as, as it sounds, we had really from the inside, once at the Reich Leadership School, I heard about the extermination. I thought about it a lot later. Why doesn't one go into that? A similar contradiction characterizes the statement of a former nurse, quotes, yes, we didn't know about it. The same was true with the concentration camps. A patient also explained to me once, some years before the end of the war, that so many Jews were being gassed. I said, I don't believe it. Something like that can't possibly be true. And then he said, I've seen it with my own eyes. Another woman enlisted an English newspaper columnist to defend her father and the Germans from the charge that they knew about the Holocaust before the end of the war, and then conceded that knowledge seeped through long beforehand and that her father had learned about the final solution as early as 1942. Even a woman with first-hand experience of the persecution and deportation of Jewish people, who knew that a Jewish neighbor and her daughter had been deported to camps in the East after the wife was divorced by her Aryan husband, who made the explicit admission that, quotes, we knew exactly what was going on, end quotes, and who had discussed the killing of Jews in the Flossenburg concentration camp of the soldier on leave, even this woman claimed that she did not know about the final solution. She insisted that everything was kept secret from the German people and concluded by citing examples of the ubiquity of Nazi terror as if fear of the Gestapo somehow explained her and her contemporaries' ignorance of the genocide. So this is the only part that's a little more theoretical. You have to concentrate a little bit. So. Uh, one way to characterize the interviewee's knowledge of the Holocaust before the end of the war, war 
is that they knew facts that should have led them to conclude that atrocities were being committed against Jews, including that they were being subjected to systematic extermination. Indeed, given what these interviewees concede they knew, it, it took an act of will for them not to have known what was going on. They had to avert their eyes to avoid seeing what was right in front of their noses. Thus, one woman whose description of the deportation of the Jews of Frankfurt I quoted earlier, earlier goes on after saying they were supposedly being resettled there in the East, immediately to claim, and about mistreatment and that sort of thing, perhaps that seeped through near the end of the war, but we had no specific knowledge. No, we didn't get that. For those interviewees who knew and yet did not know, it seems as if knowledge of the final solution was conscious, but set off from the main sector of awareness, which remained blissfully ignorant, a vertical split of consciousness. For those who knew enough to know, have known absolutely, it seems as if the final solution was discerned, but then immediately repressed, a, his, a horizontal split of consciousness. Although it is possible that the interviewees knew about the final solution before 1945 and only later denying knowing, one should not simply dismiss their claim, the claims of the interviewees that they saw what was in plain sight but looked away so quickly that they were able to prevent the knowledge from registering in their consciousness completely. There is a difference, this is the hard bit, there is a difference between perception and knowledge. When interviewees looked away from the persecution of Jews and forgot what they had seen after taking three steps, they perceived, but they could not or would not integrate the perception into the structure of consciousness. They did not know what they had seen. And as soci sociologists and psychologists have made clear, knowledge is a social phenomenon and knowing is a social act. For something to be known, it must be shared and validated by others. Without social affirmation, perception remains ungrounded, uncertified, and ultimately without meaning. Knowledge held in common is a condition of community, and a community conditions what its members know. The role played by society in integrating perception into consciousness is especially significant in a community as intense, as controlling, and ultimately as tenuous as the Nazi Volksgemeinschaft. That is to say, there was a mutually reinforcing relationship between social consensus and knowledge during the Third Reich. What Germans knew was in part the product of social consensus, and accepting what was commonly known was a condition for membership in the community. By the same token, social consensus and community were affirmed and strengthened by common knowledge. And for those, like the interviewees, who needed so powerfully to belong to the collective, the ability to know what was unacceptable to and invalidated by the community of the people was extremely limited. Acknowledging the final solution would have asserted the I against the we, and alienated the knower from the Volksgemeinschaft, a racial community in which Jews and their persecution were to be eliminated from consciousness. For if the persecution of Jews was acknowledged, then Jews were acknowledged. And if Jews were acknowledged, then they could be experienced as human beings. They were to be rendered invisible. They were to vanish from the face of the earth. Like the interviewees in my study, Germans interviewed for other oral histories manifested the same inability to see Jewish people and looked quickly away without thinking from their mistreatment. Some claim to have overlooked the persecution of Jews during the Third Reich altogether, including Kristallnacht, Jews wearing the yellow star or their deportations. The sociologist Gabriela Rosenthal understands the efforts of her interviews, interviewees to push the persecution of Jews uh, away by not putting it into words or even allowing it to register in their consciousness as an effort to maintain emotional distance from the suffering of the victims. In Rosenthal's view, the interviewees sought quotes to evade the victims because they produced 
uncomfortable feelings. The reaction of a woman interviewee in Rosenthal's study who as an adolescent encountered Jews wearing the yellow star during the war is typical. One avoided seeing the people, looking at them or meeting them. One felt extremely uneasy. Jewish people experience the evasion, the looking away, the not seeing as a dehumanization. Rosenthal quotes Frau Meissner, who had been a forced laborer at a concentration camp in Silesia after 1944. Meissner recalled how the inhabitants of the town, quotes, never ever looked at us as she and her fellow inmates passed by on their way to work. They somehow or other managed to turn their heads away, for one wasn't supposed to see us. It wouldn't have been pleasant for them to have done so. If one didn't see us, why, then we didn't exist. And then there was no concentration camp in the neighborhood. If one didn't see us, then also one couldn't see what people looked like, how, how they were, how they were dressed, what sort of people they were. If one doesn't look, then one doesn't witness. That's what I think. In sum, closing off empathy for Jews on the part of interviewees and their fellow Germans had at least two sources. In the first place, to have empathized with Jews who were being persecuted, deported, and ultimately exterminated would have caused the, the interviewees to experience bad feelings. As I suggested earlier, the inability to tolerate bad feelings can be traced back to the strategy of denial that the interviewees had developed as adolescents in response to the historically engendered losses they had experienced during the Weimar Republic. In response to the losses that the interviewees were unable to face and work through in the family, they had turned to the collective for psychological support. The vital role played by the collective in sustaining the interviewees is the second reason why they closed off empathy for Jews during the Third Reich. Perhaps the identity of all groups depends to one degree or another on exclusivity. Certainly the identity of the Nazi Volksgemeinschaft depended equally on who belonged and on who did not. For the Nazi Volksgemeinschaft was a ra racial collective whose existence demanded the exclusion, if necessarily the violent exclusion, of racial undesirables from the community. Thus, in order to belong to this racial coll collective, it was necessary to exclude Jews cognitively and emotionally from consciousness, from the Reich, and ultimately from humanity. And essential to that process of exclusion was the closing off of, off of empathy for Jewish people. In sum, it was the need on the part of the interviewees and of their fellow Germans to belong to the racial collective of the Volksgemeinschaft that provided a central motivation for the Holocaust. And it was the closing off of empathy for Jews on the part of the interviewees and their fellow Germans that enabled the Holocaust to be carried out. Let me bring today's presentation to a close by returning to the experiences of those who are at the heart of my book. Loss and its denial is the central theme of the interviewees and of their lives and of the lives of these people. Sorry, loss and its denial is a central theme of the interviews and of the lives of these people. And yet there are places in the interviews where sadness slips out. Although they rarely remembered their dreams, in every dream they recalled either the interviewee is alone or the dreams otherwise convey abandonment and loneliness. And there are enduring memories that convey powerful images of loss. Let me conclude this talk with one of them. The memory which haunted the interviewee came from the immediate post-war period. A bit this is, the, this is the memory. A bit later, the trains began to run again. I tried to get through, of course, back to my mother, who still lived in Dortmund Kirchhörde Schanze. But the trains were all filled up. Even the roofs of the trains were covered with people. Everything was full of people. And you tried to get into the station, and, and when you managed to get in, it was the same on every railway platform. Always more people trying to get onto the trains. There were always those who reached out their hands to the people, trying to get on board, and others who pushed the people away. I don't know which group was in the majority, in such an exceptional situation, so much out of the ordinary, that's when people show themselves for what they are. Their essential nature comes to the fore. They don't even realize what they are doing. I have often wondered what human beings are capable of, and of all those many, many goodbyes. To this day, I can't bear to watch 
when people say goodbye to one another on a railway platform. The interviewees had reached out their hands to bring others on board in the youth movement during the Weimar Republic, in organizations like the Work Service during the Third Reich, and in the free German circle after the war. But they also pushed people away, or stood by passively while others did so. And therein lies a, the moral failure of a generation. Not everyone could be a member of their collective, whether it was that of the youth movement, of the Nazi Volksgemeinschaft, or even of the free German circle. If just anyone could have belonged to their group, it would have lost its exclusivity, its harmony, its identity, its purpose. So some people had to be excluded in order to give life and power to the collective on which their lives depended. And that desperate need to belong, and with it inevitably to exclude, came in part from, quote, all those many, many goodbyes they had experienced over the course of their lives, goodbyes they could not bear to watch. Thank you. Thank you.